Welcome to another exciting episode of Star Tales. Today, we talk with a star who has created a buzz in tech world and here to inspire us with their journey. Today, we have Abhijit Oak, who is VP at Katera, a construction unicorn, which is optimizing the cost and time to market by 50%. Welcome, Abhijit. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Rama. How are you? I'm doing good, uh, Abhijit. Um, uh, I mean, something that has that I have been very curious about is you have seen the dot com boom of 1990s, and then yep. you have seen the transition to cloud computing and AI, ML, and all the latest greatest technologies out there. How would you describe your journey? Sure. So I'm a civil engineer by training. So I graduated with a degree in civil engineering and started working for a EPC company designing thermal power plants and cement factories. And there was a need of automation, that's why I started programming. And that one thing led to another, and I started working for a company writing structural analysis software. That's how I moved to the US. And then uh, after that, I spent a bunch of time there and that was pretty uh, interesting because all, I. I was lucky that in late 80s, so 88, 89, was the cusp of the end of the mainframe. And PCs were coming in as well as, in, what I mean end of the mainframe is in the engineering solutions world. Uh, the PC was coming in and most of the larger manufacturers were creating these Unix boxes. So a, a, there used to be a company called Digital, which doesn't exist anymore. So they had Deck Altrix, IBM had AIX, Sun had Sun OS and Solaris, you know, HP had HP UX. And so, so they were creating their own risk-based architectures. And these were basically Unix variants you know, with their stuff. And I was lucky enough to work on all these and port our structural analysis software for them. You know? So I got to work on Craze, got to work on this. And so it was definitely interesting. You know? So learned a lot about Unix, learned a lot about TCP IP, learned a lot about sockets. and. And there was also the push to uh, parallel, parallel processing then, you know, which really didn't pan out very well. Then. So it was very interesting working on that. And then, then basically I joined Autodesk, a company that makes a product called AutoCAD and started working on AutoCAD. And that's when the dot-com boom happened. You know? And it was, in hindsight, it was a very interesting time because everybody wanted to, everybody knew that this is new and important and everybody needs to go to it. People didn't know how to use it. So a lot of startups that started, essentially, at least from my vantage point, were they were spending a godful amount of money on hardware. Like you could barely buy a server, you could barely buy a storage device. You know? So companies like Cisco, EMC, uh, compact then, right, were making uh, all this equipment which people were buying and putting together. And so the richness of apps was very low. There was a lot of, lot of hardware being thrown around and a lot of people building a lot of things. And the only people making money were people write or getting high valuations were people writing uh, the browser. So if you remember, Netscape was a big player then. Yes. And you rarely hear about anybody else anymore. Even Netscape, half the people don't know that it exists. <laughs> it's 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 pretty interesting that uh, pretty much everything that started then uh, uh, practically died except for uh, Yahoo. You know, Yahoo was the last survivor. You know, and still exists. Uh, Microsoft got in the game with Hotmail. Microsoft had a pretty incredible browser. Microsoft kept Apple live. Uh, uh, how should I viable by giving them money? so that they could load their browser on the Apple machines, you know? So it was a very, very interesting time. So I was working on a desktop product. We were making a lot of money with this product, a product called AutoCAD. And we, we started doing some unnatural acts, you know, such as like, how do you put some content online? Or how do you do application sharing, you know? Is, 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 is there a scope of application sharing? I remember working on a feature called Meet Now, you know, which was essentially like a, a go-to meeting with AutoCAD, you know. And of course, it has its own problems, you know, with graphic acceleration, with the pipes size, etc. But uh, that's what happened in that dot-com boom, you know. And then, you know, the rest, and then things started stabilizing better, uh, 
better tools started coming out. There was a lot of rationalization in tools. Uh, oh, what a beautiful journey from civil engineer to extreme technology to automation. I think you've witnessed quite a lot of transformation that has happened in the companies. And um, my question is, um, I'm sure there must be quite a few challenges in your career path, few hits, few misses. How did you overcome them? Anything you want to share with us? Sure. I, I think the main thing I've realized is if you put your heart into it and if you are going to be true to your trade and work on things, normally good things will happen. You know? I think I can, I really don't have any regrets you know, in terms of I should have done this, I should have done that. You know? And I know it's been, it's been a great ride. You know? Thanks, Abhijit. I mean, I have interfaced with you and uh, I have always seen you as a strong proponent of automation, be it a human to machine interface or a machine to machine interface, anything, everything. You have been a strong proponent of technology, bringing in technology, automating it and so on and so forth. Now, there are segments which have adopted technology and have seen ROI in terms of increasing their efficiency and optimizing their cost. Now, there are other segments which have refused to bring in the digital aspects into their industry. And this includes construction as well. Um, I would like to know your insights as to how this is all panning out for the ones that have adopted and for the ones that are trying to adopt. Yeah, so, so I think what we, what we really need to understand is what kind of business you're running, right? So the problem in construction is, so this was, a, a, I'm say a rude awakening for me. I thought I'll be a civil engineer with all these noble ideas of I'm going to build stuff. I'm going to make the environment better. I'm going to make uh, life better for everyone, better buildings, better this, better that. And very soon you realize that construction is, is, is like a hedge fund. It's less about building. It's more about money management. So if you notice large construction companies, most of their leaders are CPAs. So like in India, right? It's like Hindustan construction for the longest time, their CEO was a chartered accountant, you know? And, and, and really you're managing money, you know? And so what happens in an industry like that, right? There are two, three reasons. One thing is the leadership doesn't understand the power of automation. Second thing is because you're using somebody else's money, right? Increasing profitability is not seen as a top priority. So you're not going to invest in that, right? And then finally, what is happening or what I've seen happen many a times is in certain economies, people don't want the added transparency. And, and so, so those are the factors that contribute to lack of automation. Now, what is happening is, I think th that was the reason I, I started working with Katera was the whole idea of industrialized construction, right? Let us try to produce as much as possible offsite in the factory and put it together, right? I think that changes the game and that is where automation becomes even more important because you're actually visualizing and creating something before building it. So the mechanical engineering industry went through this, right? So engineering drawing, I remember going through two engineering drawing classes, you know, and I thought they were fairly tough, you know, in the senses, but again, it does make you understand how to read a drawing, you know? And now what's happening say in mechanical engineering is, if you want a part made, you basically create a 3D part and send it to the machining, whatever person, they put it to their CAM software and get it manufactured. I think that level of automation, once that starts arriving in, uh, in construction and when construction starts getting looked at as not building, but assembling, right? And you start using words like parts and assemblies or sub assemblies. I think that is where you'll start seeing more and more automation and the need for more and more management where more technology and automation will play a big part. Awesome. So now that we are talking about automation and um, uh, so uh, 
um, in parallel, there are industries and even people are talking about design. So when I say design, it's not about the aesthetics, but people are taking a design first approach to solve certain problem. Uh, like for example, if you look at Uber, Uber doesn't have a call center. They moved the entire support and the content on the digital platform. Now a design studio has to ensure that those content can be found easily and those content can be accessed easily. So can you talk about your experience with design and, um, and any insights about the design? Sure, I think, I think I have a very simple philosophy about design, right? Design is something that makes things simpler to use, right? Design is something that lets, uh, makes things uh, easy, right? U users feel like they are at ease, users feel that they can, they can use the product you know, and get whatever they think the product is going to do for them done. Right? Everybody, everybody talks about Apple and Apple design and stuff. To this day, I won't use an Apple phone because there's no back button. You know? Right? And, and that's why I'll use an Android phone. You know? Now, I think everybody talks about Apple and Apple design and what they did and how one button and simplicity and all. Maybe that's not for everybody. You know? Right? So I think I think another very very important thing in my in my mind for design is the ability to understand what you're trying to do, right? So let me give you an example. When you look at a jumbo jet, right? When you look at a large commercial airplane, even to date, the latest one, like whatever the seven eight seven or the Boeing three eighty or pick your latest airplane, you go in the cockpit, right? you see like 8,000 buttons on the ceiling. You know? Okay. Some of some people who will equate that to an old school dialogue, right? With thousands of buttons and this, and they'll say, why do you need that? The reason it's there is for redundancy. You cannot take those things out because everything, theoretically, if you look at it, you could put all of that on a panel. You know? Right. The reason they don't do that is because they need the redundancy. Because when shit hap happens, right, they have to uh, fix things. You know, and, and so, so in design, right, making sure that those things are accessible to the pilot, the pilot can learn it quickly and deal with it, right, is extremely important. I think to me, that's what design's all about. You know, I think I think what happens is, I've seen people talk about. Uh, user research and spend god awful amount of time in trying to research and stuff that for the longest time that had become like the key phrase you know i'm a user research person you know and i research users i interview people and and these are the same people who give you the adage of ford and the and and the car right because when ford if ford would have done user research then we would have asked for asked for a faster horse you know right they wouldn't have asked for a car because they didn't know what a car was you know so I think, I think to me, design is, again, make it easy, make it simple, make it pleasing that people actually want to use it. Thank you so much. That was a great example. So um, my question is, in this automation world, right, um, what role does design play? And um, have you experienced anything where uh, you felt that design could have solved this even better? You have to think about it a bit, you know. But you know what? Let me give you an architectural example. So, design and architecture, right? I don't know if you've noticed this. There are a lot of buildings. You go into the building, and there's a huge space, and you enter that building, and you have no idea what to do now. So, you're trying to visit somebody. You enter that building, and you have absolutely no idea what to do. And then there'll be some buildings you'll get into, which are like twice the size, and you go in, and they're designed in such a way that you know exactly what to do, you know. There's a reception there, you just walk up there, you tell them what you want to do, and boom, you're done. You know? mm. So so, so simple things like this, right, make design go a huge way. You know? and, and, and you see that in daily life, right? There are certain products that you, know, you notice, it's like there are 50 of them, and then one stands out. It's because they simplify the things that matter. Awesome, great. 
um, this was very much insightful, Abhijit. Really, really appreciate the time spent and giving us all the insights here. Uh, it was a pleasure, albeit virtual conversation. I'm sure uh, there are a lot of people that will get inspired with this. And uh, I, I really enjoyed the session. And I'm sure there are people that are going to enjoy this too. Stay tuned for more. Absolutely. See you guys. Thank you.